This morning we will continue in our series, uh, Prayers of Confession, because we do believe that uh, confessing our sins, repenting, and asking God's forgiveness is an integral part of what it means to be a Christian. Not just confessing if you're a non-Christian to become a Christian, but even confessing if you are a Christian and you want to continue in your relationship with the Lord. And this is what it's about today, dealing with human weakness. As we look around in the world we live in, we see many problems. And we ask ourselves, what is wrong with the world? Why do we see so many problems? Why do so few things work properly? Why do we have so many promises of things that should work, but they don't? And we end up with disappointments. What is the biggest problem in the world? Is it climate change? For us as Christians, we would say the biggest problem in the world is sin. S-I-N. That all other problems stem from that one problem. Sin. It's a word we often use in church. In our passage today, King David is going to use three different words to describe, and each of these words will have a different image as it helps us understand what sin is. All three images will work together for us. It's a classic form of Hebrew parallelism. In Hebrew, they would write two lines or three lines, and they would use different words, but it would be the same thing that they're describing. So, for example, we, we know that in Psalm 119, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. It's one word, it's one light, but two images. One image is the lamp for the feet, and the other one is a light to the path. But it's one thing that's being described, given to us in this parallel form. So when King David now writes about sin, he uses three words in the first two verses we have in our passage today. He uses three words for sin, and each one has an image that's going to help us understand sin better. The first one is transgression. Transgression. It means a going away or a departure. A willful rebellion against God and against His authority. It means turning our backs on the ways of God. Yes, Lord, I know what you want. Yes, I know what you're expecting of me, but I'm turning my back on that because I don't want to do that. Willfully. It's not negligently, it's not by accident, it's premeditated. It's my decision. I don't want to do that. It's transgression. The second word and the second image is sin. It means falling short of a mark or missing the mark. And it was used for a person shooting at a target using bow and arrows. And if the arrow would land short or if the arrow would miss the target, that would be called sin. And that image helps us because that image tells us that when we fall short of God's laws, God's ways, and God's design for us as human beings, when we fall short of that, when we miss that mark, we are sinning. And the third image, the third word, is iniquity. It means corrupt, twisted. Crooked. We corrupt good things. We twist what is right and declare it wrong. We take something that is straight and make it crooked. This is what we do as human beings. This is how we sin. All three of these words, transgression, sin, and iniquity, gives us these three images and lets us know what sin is all about. 
for us as human beings, we find sinning very easy. In fact, we have a proclivity for it. What is wrong with this world? What is the biggest problem the world is facing right now? This question was asked by a magazine, and G.K. Chesterton famously wrote back, and he said, I am. I am the biggest problem in this world. You see, it is each individual person's sinfulness that causes all the problems in the world. Now, you may be thinking, that's not me. I'm not that bad. Listen to what Hopeful had to say in the Pilgrim's Progress. Remember, he was one of the companions to Christian in the pilgrimage to the celestial city, the New Jerusalem. As he was thinking about this, he remarked and he said, Another thing has troubled me, Hopeful went on. Even since my late amendments, and his late amendments, by the way, is all the good things he tried to do, his New Year's resolutions he had, the ways that he tried to make right his life, bring his life into the right place. All my late amendments is that if I look narrowly into the best of what I do now, I still see sin, new sin, mixing itself with the best of that which I do. So now I'm forced to conclude that I have committed sin enough in one duty to send me to hell, even if my former life had been faultless. What did you do then? Christian asked. I didn't know what to do until one day in vanity I spoke to my mind to faithful, for we were well acquainted. He told me that unless I could obtain the righteousness of a man who had never sinned, neither my own nor all the righteousness of the world could save me. Did you think he spoke the truth? Not before I saw my own weakness to sin. But since I've seen the sin that cleaves to my best performance, I have now been forced to agree with him. It is only when we look deep inside ourselves we would see, when we can clearly see, that sin is mixed into even our best efforts. And this is what Hopeful saw when he, when he did that. Let us read our passage today, Psalm 32. I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. And then it says interlude, which means we pause. Let that sink in. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Interlude. Pause. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Interlude. Pause. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. 
I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey Him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, this morning we are all students of King David as he teaches us from Psalm 32. May we learn from his experience. May we gain wisdom. May we not be like the horse or the mule that needs to be guided and forced by bit and bridle. But may we be people who gladly come to you to confess our sins, to receive your forgiveness, and to stand in that strong, good, and vibrant relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and mind this morning. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When we think about sin, we often think about life before Christ. Before I knew Christ, I was sinful, yes. But now that I've come to know God, now that I've become a child of God, things have changed for me. Well, this Psalm 32 is going to actually deal with those people who are already in relationship with God, who sin. Not those who don't know God, but those who do know God. And that is, I think, where we find ourselves. You see, the Bible and this Psalm 32 deals then with the people of God who have sinned, who are repeating their sins, even though they have been forgiven and have been born again. Many scholars think that this Psalm was written a while after Psalm 51. 51, as you know, the famous Psalm where David is crying out to God after his sinful behavior with Bathsheba and with her husband. Psalm 51, written with high emotion, sort of written shortly after the events that transpired. But many people look at Psalm 32 and say, well, this was written quite a ways after that, after David has reflected upon what happened. David had some time to get insight, to get perspective. And so now he's writing Psalm 32, and he's teaching us, as he promised to do in Psalm 51, to teach others to obey God and to ask forgiveness. The reason I think this is very important comes out in Isaiah chapter 59. Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Your hands are the hands of murderers, and your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies, and your mouth spews corruption. When you read that, you think he's writing about unbelievers, Gentiles, people who don't know God, but he's not. He's writing about God's people. People who do know God, people who are in a relationship with God, covenantially bound to God, these are the folks he's writing to. And he's making the central point that your sins have cut you off from God. Your sins has become a dividing wall between yourself and your God. And because of your sins, God has turned away and will not listen anymore.
What a terrible thing to hear. Because we do want to believe that when we pray, God is going to listen to our prayers. But what Isaiah is saying is that our sins are such that God is going to refuse to listen to our prayers, to turn away from us. When David starts off in Psalm 32, he starts with describing a great joy. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. What great joy to feel that forgiveness. People who have walked carrying heavy, heavy burdens, the burdens of guilt and sin, the burdens of iniquity, transgression, those burdens have been lifted. Those people have been freed. David says, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight, where God has removed the sin from us as far as the east is from the west, where God has promised to remember it no more, never think about it again. A complete new page. A blank slate. A white robe, spotless, without blemish. This is what David is looking at and saying, how great that is, how beautiful it is, how joyful to that person who, who feels that and understands that. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. There is great joy in that, even though you might be living in difficult situations or in circumstances that are really trying, even though you may be stressed. There is great joy in knowing that your relationship with God is open. in knowing that the guilt and the sin has been lifted away from your heart and from your life. That you have been freed by God. Great joy. David starts there describing that joy. But then he goes in verse 3, and he explains his struggle. That he knew he was wrong, but he didn't confess right away. He says, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. I felt in my body your heavy hand upon me because I knew in my mind what I did was wrong but I didn't want to confess. Do you see the struggle? David starts off by saying how beautiful it is when our sins have been taken from us. But then he's saying how he struggled to confess that sin. And that while he was struggling to confess that sin, God was putting the thumb down on him. He felt God's heavy hand upon him until he lost all strength. And yet, even though he was feeling God's hand and even though he was losing his strength, he still did not confess. Do you see? Do you see the human problem here? God is the only one who can take away our sin. We know that. We know that the way to ask God to take away our sin is to confess our sin before Him, to come clean before Him. And even though we know that, we don't want to do it. That's the human problem. That's the human weakness. The Apostle Paul writes to the letter, his letter to the Romans, and he says this. He quotes Psalm 32. 
He says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. He's quoting Psalm 32, and he's saying that this is yours and this is mine only by faith in God, not by works. You see, there's nothing you can do to undo the sin that you have committed. There's nothing that I can do to take away those transgressions, those sins, those iniquities of mine. Only God can take that away. And God takes that away not by anything that I do or anything that I earn, but only by my faith. It's only when I trust Him, when I trust Him enough to come clean before Him, to open my heart and my life, to say, Lord, here I am. Here are the sins I've committed. Please forgive me. It is by faith, by trust in God, when I do that is the only time that God is going to forgive my sins. And that's the only way that I can be clean. And it's the only way that I can find God's love and God's grace and God's faithfulness. So the question then becomes, why we don't confess? And I want to give you four reasons why we don't. Firstly, we don't confess our sins because we don't want to admit that we are wrong. We don't confess because we don't want to admit that we're wrong. Basically, our pride. Some of us can be very good at justifying ourselves. Yes, of course, Lord, it could, it could look wrong if you look at it from that point of view, but look at it from this point of view and you actually think it's right. How long can we go on justifying ourselves? Because when we do, you know what happens? It's the same thing that happened to David. Our bodies waste away. We groan. We don't feel comfortable. We don't feel at peace. Our strength evaporates like water in the summer heat. That's what happens to us when we don't confess. When we choose our pride above confession. Second reason why we don't confess. We feel guilty about our sin but we rationalize that it's not a big deal. Actually, it's so inconsequential that it's not worth confessing to God and going through the whole process of repentance and forgiveness. Why bother God with something so small? It's really not such a big deal. So why come to God Repent before Him and ask Him to listen to my prayer and ask Him to extend forgiveness to me. Why go through all of that for something so inconsequential, so small, so insignificant? That's how we rationalize our sins, our small sins, and we don't want to confess. The third one is the quality of our sin. Sometimes we feel that our sin is so bad, our sin is so horrendous, that God cannot possibly forgive me. I know what I did wrong, and I know it was so wrong that I wouldn't forgive me if I was God. 
So how can God possibly forgive me for doing that? The quality of our sin is something that can hold us back from confession. Fourthly, not only the quality, but the quantity of our sin. It is when, there are, when our sins are so many that God cannot possibly think I'm serious in my repentance. Well, if you were serious, you wouldn't keep doing these sins, right? You're coming to repent, you're coming to ask me to forgive you, but you keep sinning, and you keep doing the same things. So you're not that serious when you come to ask for forgiveness. See, that's, those are the tapes we play in our mind, right? And those are the things that hold us back from asking forgiveness, from confessing. I do feel, in, sorry, I feel sincere when I ask for forgiveness, but then I go right back and sin again. So my, not just the quality of my sin, but the quantity of my sin, the repetitiveness of my sin, is what keeps me from confessing. And yet, confession is the medicine <laughs> that is going to bring healing. Confession is what's going to solve this problem in me. Confession is what's going to connect me again to the source of life. But the grace of God is such that He doesn't leave us in our sin. He speaks to us through our conscience, through other people, and through His Holy Spirit. He makes us feel guilty so that we will confess our sins, so that we will receive forgiveness, so that we will be in a good relationship with Him again. Can you see that the guilt that God lays on us is good for us? It's a grace that God gives us. David says in Psalm uh, 32, verses 3 and 4, he says, When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away. I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. This is how I felt. This is the guilt that God placed upon me. I felt that heavy hand of His. And then finally he says, I confessed all my sins to you. That's the turning point in the psalm. You see, he starts off with a great picture of how happy you can be if God forgives your sin, and then he goes to the point where you're struggling to ask for confession. But then the whole psalm turns when he says, I did confess my sins. I did it. Like Nike says, just do it. And David just did it. I confessed my sins, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I stopped doing that. I was struggling with that. I was trying to hide my guilt. I knew I was in the wrong, but I didn't want to ask for confession. But eventually, it just got so bad for me that I had to confess my sins. And I said, I'm not going to hide my guilt. I'm going to be open and clean before God. And when I did that, he says, I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And when he did that, he says, you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Can you imagine walking with guilt month after month, maybe even year after year, carrying those heavy burdens, Not because you have to, but because you want to. Because the way to be released from those heavy burdens is through God's forgiveness, when you confess. But can you imagine, after a long time carrying heavy burdens, confessing then and God just taking them away? All your guilt is gone. Amazing grace. We sang about that. In the Pilgrim's Progress, then Hopeful testifies about the same thing. He 
He says, I wasn't willing to know the evil of sin, nor the damnation that follows on the commission of it. Instead, I endeavored, when my mind at first began to be shaken with the word, to shut my eyes against the light of it. But what was the cause of your carrying of it, the first working of God's blessed Spirit on you? He says, I was ignorant that this was the work of God on me. I never thought that my new awareness of sin was a result of God seeking my conversion. Yet sin was very sweet to my flesh, and I didn't want to leave it. I didn't want to part with my old companions because their presence and actions were so desirable to me. But the hours when I was convicted of my sin were so troublesome and frightening that I couldn't bear to remember them. Testifying to God's heavy hand upon him as he's struggling to come to a place of confession. Now, if you still struggle with confession, I want to encourage you with a scripture from Hebrews. And I want to end with, with this encouragement from God's Word. And uh, it's from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and 16, about Jesus being our high priest. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I want to draw your attention to two parts there. The first part is of Christ who was tested the same way as we did, as we are tested. When the scripture says that he understands our weaknesses, that he faced the same testings, it means that he felt the force of those testings. He felt how strong it can be. He felt how powerful it can be. When he understands our weaknesses, he understands them because he experienced them himself, even though he didn't give in to the sin, but he experienced it the way that we do. Our high priest is not someone who can't identify with us. We say, oh, well, just, you know, Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You'll be okay. You can do it. I did it. You can do it. He's not like that. He's a high priest who really understands what we go through, who understands the, the power that we feel when we are tempted by sin. But secondly, I want to draw your attention to verse 16. So, because we have a high priest who understands, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Why can I come boldly? I can come boldly because I'm coming to someone who understands my situation. There we will receive His mercy. Guaranteed. We will. When we come to Him, when we confess our sins, we will receive His mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it most. His grace will be there for us. This is the encouragement I want to leave you with. When you feel that struggle inside yourself, when you know you should confess, but you don't want to confess because of various reasons, just know, just know that Christ knows and understands. And that when you come to Him and you do confess, you will receive grace 
and mercy. I'm going to pray for us. And after the prayer, I'm going to give a couple of minutes of silence so we can confess in our hearts before the Lord. Let us pray. Our merciful Father, we thank you that you never allow us comfort when we are not walking with you. When we refuse to confess our sins, you give us an inward ache as though our bones are wasting away. And we groan with an inaudible roar of guilt. You keep your hand heavy upon us, always pressing and depressing us. And our energy evaporates as dried up by the heat of a summer night. O oh Lord, the misery of unconfessed sin is a grace. It is a sign of being your child and that we are loved. Thank you for the gift of guilt. Merciful Father, thank you for forgiveness. Because when we confess our sins, there is real forgiveness for our real guilt. And the ache and the heaviness and the apathy disappear. And our hearts sing, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. You are a hiding place for me. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Loving Father, thank you for the blessed discomfort that you bring to us when we are away from you. Hear us now as we confess our sins in these moments of silence. Amen.